And now I'm going to introduce this morning's speaker. Mariah Harris has been a BCE Master Gardener for about eight years and is a certified VNLA horticulturalist and an ISA certified arborist. She's the owner of Metro Garden Works and spends her days pruning, looking at trees and maintaining sustainable landscapes in the Northern Virginia area. Thank you so much, Mariah. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you everyone for joining us. I don't know exactly where you're coming from and what the weather looks like, but it's a lovely day here. So we appreciate that you've spent the time to join us. Nicole did a, a, a great job with all the info. So I think we will just jump straight in. So we have lots of time for questions. Um, not specific to summer pruning. I just want to make sure everyone is on the same page about why you might want to prune. When I work with people, a lot of the things I'm dealing with are issues with things getting much bigger than you intended them to be. You can't see out windows or walkways are blocked. Occasionally people mention health, but I will say that that's probably the least common reason that people think their plants need pruning. The most common reasons tend to be aesthetic reasons or clearance or safety. I want to emphasize, though, that good pruning is a really important step in improved plant health. And if you have plant pest issues, if you are working with a company or anything to do integrated pest management, sometimes they call that IPM, uh, that's a whole process of making sure you have the right plant, making sure your plant is in the right location, the environmental conditions are correct. Pruning is a step to make sure that the actual conditions around the plant, airflow, sunlight, are not encouraging pests, and all of those steps occur before the application of pesticides. So if you're in a situation where you're applying pesticides regularly, consider that there could be some pruning needs as well to help alleviate some of those problems. Every time I give a pruning talk, trees are top on people's minds, and I'm happy to answer tree questions. I am an arborist. I want to emphasize, however, that trees are very long-lived organisms, and the majority of trees that have pathogens or disease issues are because of environmental stressors like the crazy places we try to squeeze them into and also from poor pruning. So I would encourage you to contact a certified arborist in your area, the International Society of Arbor Culture, that's ISA. They are an international organization. I am certified with them. They maintain a website called treesaregood.org. The website is there on the screen. You can type that in and check for arborists in your area. Arborists are not the same as tree companies. You should ask if a tree company has a certified arborist, and ideally that's the person you should be talking to or should be working on your trees. Individual states also have their own certifications. If you're from Maryland, there is a Maryland tree expert group. So there could be a couple different organizations near you that have folks that know a lot about trees that I would suggest you talk to if you need pruning and what good pruning looks like before you have somebody come out and work on that. Again, not specific to summer pruning, just want to kind of bust a couple of myths that, that kind of wander around when I'm talking to people. I get a lot of people that call me and say, listen, can you come out in the fall and prune my whatever plant? And I don't do it uh, because really fall is not a great time to prune. Maybe central Florida is a different case because of the temperatures there and the types of plants that will grow there. But if you have any sort of cold season, if you're further north than we are, we're in, in zone 7B you're going to have plants that are beginning to harden off for the year in mid to late summer. So we don't see it, but plants are beginning all of the physiological processes that take them into the cold season and allow them to live through the cold. So when you prune in the fall, you're interrupting that process. There are a couple different things that can happen. One, you force the plant to grow and you get new shoots right before things are going to freeze. And some people probably have seen plants sheared and then they get these shoots right before winter. And then those just turn brown on the first frost. So the plant expended a lot of unnecessary energy to do that just because of the pruning at that time. And for a worst case scenario, you can have a plant that doesn't survive because you interrupted its ability to harden off. Maybe if you do it once, it's not the end of the world, but repeatedly doing that can really affect the plant's longevity because it's not able to prepare for the winter season. Another myth, I'm in the business of pruning, so I shouldn't tell you this is a myth, but all your plants don't have to be pruned every year. Ideally, you're planting plants in the right place. What does right place mean? It means that the location is suitable for the size that that plant will eventually get or that the size can be maintained reasonably within that space. And the growing conditions are correct. I think this is something that people have a lot of difficulty with. Sun is one thing. 
wetness or dryness is another thing. Often some plants that we have difficulty with that grow much better or worse than we expect them to are because the soil conditions aren't right. So something that grows on a mountaintop in the sun is very different than something that grows in the bottom land next to a river in the sun. Those two types of soils are completely different. And so if you can match the growing conditions and the soil conditions to your plant, you're going to be getting better health and hopefully you don't have as much pruning needs because you fit it in the right place and it's matched to the soil. But obviously, maintaining health and making sure you've maintained the shape at its optimum health is reason to consider pruning. I also do have clients that are okay with something being pruned every year because they want it a very specific shape. That's an aesthetic reason, but in terms of plant health, it doesn't necessarily have to be pruned. And often it's good to give plants a break if you've shaped them to where they need to be. Another myth I hear a lot is people go, well, I don't, you know, I don't really know, but I, I know it needs pruning. So it's any kind of pruning is better than no pruning. I don't want to discourage anyone from pruning, but, you know, take the time. I'll show you some resources to really understand what it is you want to do with the plant and why it needs it before you prune it. Uh, a lot of times plants that are left alone while you're researching are a lot easier to correct than ones that have been really badly pruned. Shearing is one thing that makes plants hard to reshape later. And trees, again, as an arborist, I'm going to plug this whenever I can, that trees are a very special case. And because of poor pruning, you can't undo those giant cuts. So look into that stuff before you prune and that'll go a long way to keeping your plant in good shape. All right, so I said pruning resources. I've done a couple of these now, I don't know, three or four in Zoom times and inevitably I'm not gonna answer all of your questions. I will do my best. There will be questions that come up after you get off the call. I would like for you to be able to locate good resources. Um, mgnv.org. That's the organization you probably signed up for this call through. This is a partner organization with Cooperative Extension here in Virginia. They maintain a lovely website and provide a lot of information. So if you click on the education tab, since this is a recorded call where you would find this type of resources at the YouTube channel, there are some others there. You can investigate those and there are many other resources on the site. But if you go to the YouTube channel and you type in on the pages search bar, which is here on the lower right, and type in pruning, you'll get the other videos that have been recorded. I'm going to cover some stuff, but like this first result here, this pruning basics is a talk I gave a few months back. That one is going to discuss more of the, the really like how to uh, type stuff. So those are good refreshers to pair with some of these others. Do not do like I did previously put in pruning on the top bar because that will give you pruning across all of the interwebs and YouTube, which is more information that is necessary or is potentially good. So uh, stick to the search bar down here for that. And the handouts you received uh, or should have received, if you didn't, you can look here. They're publications through Virginia Cooperative Extension, which is this pubs.ext.vt.edu. Um, and if you type in pruning on that search bar, you'll get all of the publications that relate to that as well. So the publications that you received were these pruning documents. They are for different items. So there is a shrub pruning calendar. There is a deciduous tree pruning calendar, I believe, and an evergreen pruning calendar. This shrub one is going to be the one that's most applicable, but I just wanted to walk you through it so you have a sense of how you would use this. So we'll talk briefly about azaleas as a spring flowering plant. And if you see here, evergreen azalea, and the months are coming down here. So according to the key up here, these grayed out areas are the don't prune unless you need to correct damage. And this little vine tendril leaf is the best time to prune. So if you scroll along evergreen azalea, May, June, and July are the best times to prune that. And if you go all the way to the end, it has two notes that explain why. One is because flowers are produced on new wood. And seven is a health thing where you can prune out actually azalea caterpillars and galls. I don't see that very often in this area, but the area you're in might have those. So that's a consideration. So all of the publications that were emailed last night have this same format. You can go through and find your plant and you can get an idea about when it's best to prune it. Again, not specific to summer pruning. It's important to know what you're pruning. So make sure you identify your plant. You can get the correct identification, including the cultivar, and make sure that you know what it's supposed to do. Cultivars are important. Cultivar is short for cultivated variety, and that can be something that grows smaller than normal. Hopefully you have a tag on your plant, but you can also submit something to the help desk. Nurseries are also a great place to wander around and look at plants and go, oh, that's the one I have. And they're also often very knowledgeable in those places and can help you understand. Botanic gardens are also great places because they're labeled. If you have one near you with a lot of plants, that's also a good place to look and see what it's supposed to look like. 
Because we're talking about summer pruning, I want to emphasize that you are going to be paying attention to blooming because when you're pruning is different than for spring pruning. So in the case of summer pruning, if your plant blooms in spring or early-ish summer, you're probably okay to prune right after flowering. If your plant blooms much later in the summer, doesn't mean you can't prune it in the summer, but it's not okay to prune if you're concerned about flowers. But there are reasons that you would want to go ahead and prune even if you lose a few flowers, but just want people to understand depending on when the plant blooms, your pruning will affect the bloom. Fruit production is a whole category in itself. I will just touch briefly on it. If you have questions, I can try to answer them. When you're dealing with fruiting plants, what you're trying to focus on is whether or not it blooms on what's called one-year-old wood or current or new season wood. So generally, if you have a plant and you see the fruit produce six inches to 12 inches in on the branch, that's probably producing on one-year-old wood. Peaches do this. Apples produce on old wood, although the spurs are new. And then current or new season wood are plants that push shoots out and then produce the fruit on those. So figs do this, persimmons do this. So knowing what type of wood you have will determine what type of summer pruning you can get away with. And that's a whole process, like I said. This is, you know, just the anatomy of a twig. And that kind of gives you an outline of understanding what the plant is doing, where it's growing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here as we go on. We're talking about summer pruning specifically. That, you know, that, that's the title of the talk. So how is this different? Well, dormant or spring pruned plants is probably the pruning strategy people are most familiar with. When you prune plants in the spring, they are going to be more vigorous. The reason is all of the stored energy that the plant spent the growing season producing is now stored in the roots and in some of the other tissues, but primarily the roots. And when you prune a dormant plant in the spring, uh, let's say you have 10 stems and you cut five of those out. We'll say that this is uh, an idea. Uh, so you cut five of your 10 stems out. You now have 50% fewer growing points and all of that energy comes shooting out the remaining 50%, those five stems, and you get what feels like double the growth because all that energy has to come out. So often spring pruning seems more vigorous. Summer pruning is going to be very different because the plants have already pushed out their stored energy. They have no more stored energy to provide to grow new shoots. They are now getting that energy from their photosynthesis, from the leaves. So when you prune a branch back, you're quickly decreasing that energy creation capacity. And so you're not going to get that vigorous growth. That varies a little bit by plant, but that's the general idea. So expect less vigorous growth. Be much more conservative if you don't know the plant. There's that one-third rule that you'll see kicking around sometimes on pruning guides. I would say you probably want to go even less unless you are very familiar with the plant and you know that you can take more than that. You can also phase it in. If you want to take a quarter to a third of the plant, take a few branches earlier in the summer, let it regain, grow a little bit, see a little bit, and then you can do another couple smaller sessions rather than one big one. As you get to know your plants, you'll know how they respond, but that's a good rule of thumb to start. It's a great time for light thinning and shaping for pretty much anything that's on that calendar that says it's an okay time. I'm going to focus on some of the plants that you don't usually spring prune so that you can see why you're doing them in the summer. But if you have something that needs light shaping or thinning, it should be fine in the summer as long as you're focusing on, you know, not taking too much out. If you're going to do really heavy summer pruning, only the most vigorous species can handle this. And I'll show you a couple that I like to do summer pruning on rather than spring pruning. If you're going to use this on any species, it's still the same good tenets of pruning that apply regardless of the time. With every do, there's a do not. So there are a few disease issues for some trees like oaks and elms that might cause you to back off on the pruning for those in the summer. Elms are susceptible to Dutch elm disease, which is transmitted by a beetle, which is active in the summer, which smells when you cut the tree. Oak wilt is kind of a big thing that's starting up in some areas. So those are things to maybe leave the tree pruning for dormant season if you can. If your tree or shrub has health issues, don't summer prune it. Uh, summer is a stressful time as it is, so spend that time trying to identify what the problem is. If the problem is some sort of pest that's very active in the summer, for example, crepe myrtle bark scale, then you might want to go ahead with pruning. But take some time to use your help desk, um, your local cooperative extension service to diagnose that before you do any summer pruning. It's also not the time for rejuvenative pruning. So if you're familiar with some of these cut everything down to the ground, like forsythia, 
I wouldn't do it to Itea, but there are some native species you can do it to as well. By Rhea, as an example, people will sometimes cut to the ground. This would not be the time to do that because again, all that stored energy is out and then you just cut it all off. So the plants are really struggling to pull from its resources to try to grow again. So that's not the time for this. On the opposite side of that, if you do have plants you're trying to get rid of like invasive species that are popping up in your yard that are too hard to dig out or they're like in the middle of your garden bed and you don't want to dig everything else out in the process, you can use this sort of pruning to get rid of it and just keep repeatedly cutting it to the ground, including during summer. So it's not technically summer pruning, but it's a good strategy to use if you need it make sure you have good tools. I'm a left-hander, so I put a plug in. If you didn't know that there are left-handed tools, there are, so go get one. They're easier to use and make sure stuff is clean. You can disinfect tools. You'll find lots of stuff online about alcohol, dips, rubs, you know, find something that works for your environment. I'm moving a lot, so I like this type of spray bottle. Mine happens to be Lysol. Any kind of disinfectant that cleans your tools should work. If your blades are dull, sharpen them. If they need replacing, a lot of them come with this little screw that you can replace the blade. So it's worth doing that because clean cuts make better sealing on the wounds. The type of pruner that you want is this type of pruner that on the top, which is a bypass pruner. Bypass means that these two blades bypass each other. That's different than this lower pruner, which is an anvil pruner, which means that this top blade comes down onto a lower blade. Anvil pruner you'd prefer not to have because it crushes the stems. Okay. Oh, we're so close to summer pruning, but not quite. So what happens when you prune? This is something I think people don't think about a lot, but knowing how a plant is going to respond is very important to knowing what's going to happen when you prune it. So plants generally are categorized into what they'll call alternate or opposite plants. Leaf arrangement, phyllotaxy, these are all words that are used for this. What it means is going up the stem or out the stem, if you're looking at something sideways, the buds arrange alternatingly up the stem. The distance between those buds can be short or long, but it will still alternate up the stem. When you cut an alternate arranged plant, you're going to get this type of staggered growth pattern. When you cut a plant that's opposite, whorled is another example of this. Uh, opposite is two growing points across from each other. Whorled means more than that. So hydrangeas often have three. Something like Joe Pye can have five growing points around. And when you cut those, you get more of this wishbone or this fountain effect response. So it's a very different response in the growth. And often that means plants that are opposite, if you cut them a lot, you're going to get a lot of this wishbone growth. So you want to be a little bit more careful in selecting your cuts on something like that. This just shows an actual picture of what that looks like. So here's the picture of this drawing of an alternate bud. This is a service berry that was cut. You can see that staggered effect of growth about four buds behind that cut. So in this picture, they have two. In this actual example, four did that. This is a holly, which looks like it might be opposite because they're so close together, but it's actually alternate. And you can see the staggered growth at the top. This plant was sheared. I wouldn't advocate for shearing, but we can talk more about that. Most plants you're dealing with are probably alternate. This is an example of an opposite plant. So this is a branch from a possum haw viburnum, and that was cut and two branches came out after. This is a herbaceous plant. This is a, a late bone set. Same effect, two flowering points. So you can manipulate that to whatever you would like. So in this case, you can manipulate it to get a shorter and more floriferous plant, but you just have to know how the plant's going to respond. For all pruning, make a good cut. Don't leave too much of a stub. That means that little bit. In this picture, they're showing you the stub so that you can see the cut. Now, I'd say that's probably a little bit too much of a stub. I would have taken it back a little bit more. But the point is, don't get so close to the bud that you damage it. Here on the left, this is a big stub that's left. These are cuts that are going through the bud, either through the actual bud or through the backside of the bud. Try to avoid those kinds of cuts. Um, these examples are stay, stay flat above the bud if needed. Some people are not sure about angling. It's fine to do a straight cut as long as you're staying above the bud and not damaging it. If you're happy to angle it, most of my cuts tend to be angled because I'm used to it. Go opposite of the bud and it'll make the cut a little easier to avoid damage, but don't go beyond sort of the plane that this bud creates. Imagine that this bud takes up this whole space and stay above that. So I think that's the sort of huh, the nuts and bolts of the, the basics of pruning before we get going into actually what you might summer prune. Um, I'll take a stop for questions in case anyone has anything. Okay, yeah, well, we do have questions. Last year, there were lots of apples on this tree, and this year there are none. And the question mm -hmm. is whether pruning would have helped with fruiting for this year. 
Fruit trees often exhibit what's called a alternate bearing cycle. So they'll have a lot of fruit one year, less fruit one year, a lot of fruit one year, less fruit one year. You can prune for those bumper crop years and you'll get less of a bumper, but it might even out other years. That is a natural cycle that they go through anyway, but you could you could basically bring the low not so low and bring the high a little lower to even it out with pruning. That is something you could try because it's just a lot of energy expenditure for a plant. So think about it as needing to kind of take a break and, and reset for the following year. So if you even out that energy expenditure and those resources I mentioned, if you go to the VCE, the, the pubs.vt.ep, ext.edu. If you search pruning, they have a lot of good resources on fruiting because it's an agricultural extension service. They do have a lot of, and I believe apple tree pruning is one of the references in there. But yes, pruning could help even that out, but you will probably still have alternate bearing years. Spring flowering species are often unpruned uh, throughout the year because when everyone's out pruning in the spring, because it's a great time, you're tired of being indoors and it looks like a great time to be out pruning, these plants are about to bloom or are blooming, and so people don't prune them. And generally speaking, you know, if a plant hasn't been sheared, it's going to be a lot easier to prune. Again, if it's in the right place, it's even better. These are azaleas, evergreen, probably oriental hybrid azaleas. They're not native, but they're blooming in the spring. They have lots of space, so that's helpful. Um, they're allowed to sort of drift into these open areas, which is good. That's what that plant wants to do. For something like this, if you have a situation that looks like this, I wouldn't focus too much on doing a whole lot, maybe removing some of the branches that are wayward in the way, you know, I would say cut back your lawn a little bit and just let the plants come out. But if that's an issue and you want to maintain your lawn, then you might have to take out some of these lower branches that are extending too far. The trick with the azaleas, I'm going to show you on the next slide with rhododendron is the way they're arranged that determines how you cut them. Uh, a plant like this, your goal is not to really shape it. It's mostly to lightly thin it, take out a few of the branches that are coming way through to expose uh, some of the interior leaves to more light so that's healthier condition that way. Um, and you get less disease. Mites are kind of a problem on azaleas, but you can't get rid of them with pruning and they generally don't kill the plant. So I wouldn't go out of your way to prune them to get rid of all those because you won't get rid of them. So this is a rhododendron, which is the same family. It's actually the same plant as azaleas. The reason this is not the most beautiful rhododendron you've ever seen, but the reason I like this picture is you can see the way the branches work. The way rhododendrons and azaleas grow is this sort of world pattern where you have a location which has many branches coming from it. You have uh, this stem and then a new set begins. And the same thing occurs going sideways. So you have this, this is a section that has several stems and then one of those shoots out and continues and it's gonna keep going sideways. This stem down here illustrates that really well where you can see the four coming out. So when you're pruning a spring flowering azalea or rhododendron, don't prune something to the middle of any of these find the next location to prune back to. So in the case of this tip back here, if I just want to lighten the plant or this part is sticking too far out, I'm going to follow this flowering stem back until it joins this flowering stem and maybe that flowering stem I want to keep. So I will prune this just outside where that one starts. If this whole lower portion is a problem, let's say you have a, a beautiful Stokes aster sitting under here and it's coming up, you might take this stem all the way back to this main stem. Any of these locations, these arrows are all spots where you can prune that small branch, something like these lower branches. If coming really low is a problem for you, you can take a few back. You don't have to take the whole thing back. Take out this little one right here, prune it back to here and leave the other three or four on there. What that can do is lighten the stem consider lightening the whole stem rather than taking the whole thing out because then it's awfully naked at the bottom and you might have to plant other things because you don't like how it looks. So start conservative and you can decide if you need to take more. But this strategy of finding the next growing point and pruning back to that point is going to be the same for azaleas because these are the same plant and they grow the same way. In this case, the plant from a health perspective, there's really no reason you have to prune it. Um, this owner is not concerned about the view out the window. In fact, he likes seeing the blooms in the window. So it's perfectly fine the way it is. It's not encroaching on the house. I don't see any reasons to prune it that way. For me, because I look at a lot of plants, visually, I think this plant is in kind of a prominent location, so I would probably try to keep it fuller. It's also been growing for a long time without pruning. So if you have a rhododendron that looks like this and you are concerned that it's 
not as leafy, you know, it's, it's more stem than leaf, you can do a few pruning cuts and they will respond well and actually put on new growth and feel bushier later. So if that was a concern for this person, I might do some light pruning. You could do it now after flowering. Any of these points that I cut to will encourage some new leaf growth further back and you might get a little bushier plant. Where those growing points are is where you're trying to cut to. Don't just find a random step. Again, if this is your window and you really don't want something there, consider taking this stem out possibly, but leaving these other ones. If even those are too high, come down to this next shelf. I, that, that's kind of what I call them is like a shelf. So come down to this lower shelf if needed. If you want the plant exactly six feet, you're not gonna get it exactly six feet. The plant is gonna tell you, oh, I have to be five and a half feet because this is where this is. Okay, maybe this is three feet, I don't remember. But that's what you're looking for is a balance between where you wanna cut it to and what makes sense for the plant. This is a fringe tree. This is another example of a spring flowering tree. Dogwoods would also be in this category. You know, something like this, save larger pruning sessions for a spring pruning. Smaller cuts to lighten the heavy bending branches, that would be okay for summer. Consider that you're going to lighten some things and maybe mark those branches that you want to take out for spring pruning. A few crossing branches, not a big deal. Fringe trees, I will say, you don't necessarily have to correct every last crossing in one moment, you can phase something like that and take stuff out. Another thing to consider on these multi-stem trees is that there is such a thing as too many stems. So once you have three to five, if they're not huge or seven would be excessive, I think, um, you know, maybe use, use a marker or a flag and mark which branches you wanna take out for your spring pruning session. If it's something thin and wispy, let's say, pencil width or smaller. Now, I don't think that's a problem for taking out for summer pruning, but if you're talking about branches that are curtain rod size, I guess our curtain rod standard, something like that or wider, maybe save that for a spring pruning. What you're focusing on is, am I taking out too much of the plant and I will put the plant under a lot of stress because I've removed too much of that energy production? That's that's what you're using to balance. If you're not sure spring is the better time for something bigger, feel free to lighten up cuts. Again, pay attention to where the plant grows. Fringe tree grows very similarly to the azaleas and rhododendrons I just showed, there's going to be a point where multiple stems come out. So if this is an issue of coming out too far, find that next point further down the branch. If eventually it looks like, you know what, that looks too strange, I've got to take the whole branch out. That's fine. Take it to the main stem. Any of these sort of intermediate cuts where you cut in the middle are just going to end up with a stub that dies back that also looks strange. Dogwoods have a slightly different style as well. Depending on where you live, dogwoods can be very afflicted by health problems. And so they're ones that if you don't have to do a lot of pruning on, you know, again, those smaller cuts where you lighten branches or get them out of the way is perfectly fine. If a plant has a lot of health issues, I try to minimize my pruning. The native dogwood falls for me in that category. I mentioned that there are vigorous species that you can prune. Uh, somebody asked about hollies. We are going to cover hollies. Hollies and viburnums are very vigorous growers. So if you can prune them later in the summer with a summer pruning, you're going to maintain the size. That's usually the problem people have with these is their size is too big. If you spring prune these things, you're going to get this burst of regrowth and it's going to be completely counterproductive if you're trying to manage the size because it'll just shoot right back. Another option you can use that I'll show here is multiple pruning sessions where you're doing something in the spring and then something a little bit later if you're going to really drastically reduce the size. So we'll look at an example of that. So this holly is in a HOA and because of some rules must be maintained at six feet or lower. So the prior pruning person pruned it with shears, which is why you see all this top growth. Shearing isn't really helpful for maintaining size because as you can see, as soon as you cut it, it sends up shoots that are greater than what was there potentially. So it's now immediately above that height. So this was in April of 2021. The first thing that I did was I went in and I took branches. You can't see the branches, but what you can see is the holes that are left over. Why am I making holes in the plant? Well, it's basically I'm treating it a bit like a hedge and the interior of that plant is getting absolutely no light. And so there are no leaves on any of those branches. If I want to bring the size down dramatically, I would prefer it if there are leaves there so it looks better, better for the plant that it has some sort of energy production. So I started by opening holes up in the plant. I took out large branches and I cut deeper into the plant to do that. Then I went back in July of the same year. This was when I had already started. You can see that the sign, the branches around the sign I've started taking. These are four to six foot long branches, but this plant was eight feet tall. So that 
gives you an idea eight to nine feet in some spots. So that's how big of the branches I'm removing are. You are not going to reduce the size of a plant like this by, you know, taking 12 inches at a time. Some of those branches are going to have to be large. The goal with those is take large branches out of areas that are less visible because if there are big holes in the top, no one notices. The ones at the sides are a little more noticeable. So in those areas, focus on making sure there's a leafy point that you're cutting back to. Again, this was April of 2021, and this is after the summer pruning. I've brought it completely down below the sign. It was, should have been about six feet. That was about the max I could do because, again, this hadn't been pruned before in the way to get internal growth. So this is what I was comfortable doing. Ideally, I'd like to bring it lower, but that's what we did for that one. So again, this was July of 2021, and it's taken about two years to get back to that. So is the plant on the right beautiful? No, not necessarily. But if you're a homeowner and you're trying to maintain a plant, I'm trying to give you techniques that you can use to manage it every other year rather than twice a year if you use something like shearing. This is going to undergo another large pruning in about two weeks, and then we'll really bring it down. My goal would be to bring it down below what we did previously, but I needed to let it grow back to be able to do that. So this is a holly. You can use this technique on various hollies, even upright hollies. This is more of a bush holly. If you use something on an upright holly, you're going to probably get a lot of shoots from the base, even in subsequent years, then you'll have to decide if you're going to keep those shoots or not. For large hollies, this is kind of a form of tree topping. These aren't canopy trees, so I'm less concerned about topping, but that is in effect what you're doing to an upright holly if you do that, a foster holly or a Burford holly, Nellie Stevens holly. Any of those are more tree type hollies. Viburnums are another example. People struggle a lot with viburnums because they grow so vigorously. This one was left unpruned for I'm not sure how many years, but you can see the size of the branch here on the left. I took out one branch before I realized I should take a picture of it first. So you can see though that it's a very large branch. A lot of those branches were cut either to the ground because it came from the base or sometimes the main stem. But overall, once those were out, it's shaped like the original plant was just in a smaller form. This is a very hard pruning. I know that this species can take it. I know hollies can take it. If you're not sure, you wouldn't want to use this drastic of a pruning. Stick to that 25%, 30% we talked about. And you can do it in phases. You can do one in a couple of weeks. You might have a little wonky lopsided plant while you're waiting, but you can explain to the neighbors that it's good pruning. Just do it that way if you're not sure. Any questions? There was one about sweet spire. I have some other specific plants as well. Okay, so sweet spire. I'm going to write these down because they fall into sort of categories. Any others? Cornus arctic fire uh, that I guess historically has been pruned around this time and is yet to bloom. And the question is whether the pruning is the problem as to why it has yet to bloom. Both Caria japonica and Virginia sweet spire and dogwood arctic fire are all what I would call cane type plants. And I would prune them using a cane pruning strategy. The other video, the pruning basics video that came up on the website, that one I talk a lot more about cane pruning. I wouldn't do a whole lot of summer pruning on any of those. Again, if there's a problem with a branch, if it's growing too far or with a cane, you could certainly prune that one or two back. I wouldn't stop you from doing that. I think what I would recommend for all uh, cane plants is if you have a cane that's in the way, don't shorten the cane. Take the cane all the way to the ground, and that will allow the regrowth from the base and avoid having to just keep cutting that stub. Go look at your cane plants if they're a problem and see if you've just been cutting the stubs back and they just keep shooting back. If you see ones like that, just cut those all the way to the ground. If you're just cutting one or two right now, it shouldn't be a huge issue for the plant. If you think you're getting up into the one-third range I would save that for spring so that you can get a nice flush of new growth from the base. Caria operates the same way. Caria, the one reason you might prune now is there are a couple diseases that show up and I have had to trim back Caria canes to get rid of the little cankers that show up on the stem. It's really better though for Caria to just get rid of those stems altogether in the spring so that the new growth doesn't have that. And you also have to remove all of the leaves from the site because of the fungus on the leaves. A sweet spire is another one. I think people mess up the shape by 
partially cutting it. So if it's a vigorously growing one and you have enough stems, I would cut that cane all the way to the ground rather than partially cutting it. Loripetalum, it's not a cane plant. It can be more of a tree form. It depends a little bit on how you have it trained. Follow the same honoring the plant shape and find the growing points that make sense. So if it's going off to the side, prune it back to a branch or a twig that's going in the direction that you already want. They tend to have kind of a, a draping shape, at least in the bush form. So cut it in a way that maintains that drape. Don't cut something part way that sticks straight up in the air because it'll look funny. So that's, I think, what I would say about Laura Petalum. Avocados, I'm going to have to think a little bit about. The best thing I know about avocados is that it takes multiple species to fruit. <laughs> so I don't know anything about Lola, but if Lola needs uh, a Luan or a Joanne or something else grown with it to fruit, avocados are worse than, I say worse because apples require at least two others for some. So you'd have to be planting three apple species to fruit. And I think avocados are the same. They're at least the same. And I think they can be even more complicated, but I'll try to learn more and get back to you on the avocado. <laughs> And then we have a question about a few more species. One is about a viburnum. If it's berry producing, when is the best time to prune? Do your birds eat the berries or do they just shrivel on the plant? That would be the other question I would have. Okay. I've seen both. Well, I'll see if I get a response. Yeah, let's that. see if we get that one. We have a question about a huge rosemary that appears to be dying in the inside. Rosemary and lavender are two you can summer prune as well. I didn't mention those. I've pruned a rosemary pretty recently. What you want to look for on both of those species is to look at the plant and see where the new growth spurs are happening. So the biggest mistake that people make on rosemary and lavender is they cut so far back that they cut into what I would call unproductive wood, wood that is not going to have any new shoots. So take a look at your rosemary, start at the tip and walk backwards, backwards meaning to the interior of the plant, to the stem, to the base. So walk backwards to the interior and find the spot that has a new growth shoot and clip it to just that point and let that new shoot take over. This dying on the inside concept can happen with these because the growth pushes further out. So the inside is just stems and the outside has all the growth. Lavender does the same thing. So work your way back, find uh, a growth point further in and only cut to that and cut to those points and then it'll bush out again after that. Lavender, you can do the same thing with post bloom. Some lavender is getting ready to bloom now. After it blooms, you can go through and cut it back and you'll get the same sort of bushy effect. Lavender and rosemary are this in-between category, sort of where they're between woody perennials and herbaceous plants, but you can use the same technique on those to get them bushier. Now, the problem you're going to have is if you've let it go for too long, you might not be able to get it very bushy. In that case, what I would recommend is taking one of your branches and bending it down to the ground and using a landscape staple or a rock to hold it down. And then that plant will root and then you can restart from that plant or go $7, $5, wherever, whatever it costs where you are for a new one and start one. If they've grown too long without being pruned, they will get really woody and it is difficult to get them maybe as far back as you would like, but try it and see if, if it looks good enough for what you need in your space. And if not, you might have to start it from a new plant. The viburnum question has popped back and the response about the berries is that the birds eat the berries on the blue muffin viburnum. Oh, the arrowwood blue muffin. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that because I've seen blue muffins and I wondered if birds eat the berries or not. Sometimes with cultivars, they don't. So for a blue muffin, I would say what you're going to do is treat it more like a cane plant and take some old canes and do that in the spring. And yes, you will lose those canes of fruit, but you're going to get new ones regenerating. So you'll have some of each. Otherwise, if you start cutting viburnums at the tip, that wishbone growth that I mentioned is just going to change the shape of your plant and it's going to become unmanageable. So for the most part, viburnums, I like to treat like cane plants and whatever I want to prune, I'm going to prune it all the way to the ground or pretty far low. So it restarts two new shoots from much lower. So you will have to sacrifice some. Yeah. If your plant's big enough, I think that that's what I would do just because viburnums get really strangely shaped if you do anything else with them. And I don't want to set you up for that. We have a question also about chokeberry and inkberry bushes. I go into a lot of detail on the pruning basics. Go check the MGNV website because the 
the inkberry is the plant that I use and I have pictures of. So I show the pruning technique very specifically for that. For chokeberry, that one can get leggy. I don't think you have to do anything specific for it, but if you get really long stems that are falling over or they have no leaves except at the tip, you may have to cut those two thirds of the way back and let them restart from lower because they just keep growing at the tip. But check out that other video for the inkberry because I do explain and it, that's the subject plant. So it's very appropriate. I have two more species here. So one with knockout roses, Julie posted a response in the chat, but if you have any thoughts too on knockout roses. Knockout roses were produced to be easy to take care of. And that involves not having to do anything to them is the theory. I like to prune them like I would a regular rose and I can bring the size way down, but that's definitely a spring pruning. There is probably some deadheading that you can do to encourage a second bloom. But again, that's part of the beauty of the knockout. The theory is that you should get that rebloom even with less work. But definitely like any rose, I don't like a lot of congestion. So I'm always thinning things out, but disease is less of an issue with the knockout. So you've probably picked the best species for least work in that sense. But if you want to practice your pruning on it, you can use any of the same techniques that you would with another rose pruned back in the spring. Usually landscapers just like straight chop them across the top. I don't think that's good pruning. Use that as an opportunity to practice. That's a great species that's very forgiving. And then just two more species here, crepe myrtle and beauty berry. If it's an Asian beauty berry, you can cut back the stems pretty low to the base. I guess you treat that one a little bit like you do the cornus arctic fire, which is often pruned to the ground in the spring before it grows. The reason you do that for the arctic fire is because you want the new shoots to be red. If you don't care if the new shoots are red, don't worry about it. You can let it grow into a bigger plant. Beautyberry is the same. You have all of these shoots coming out and you're going to bring those all the way back to like one foot. It depends on the final size. So if you saw that the shoots grew three feet and you won't want your plant bigger than that, then you're going to have to cut them way back. If you're good with a five foot arc out, then cut it back to two feet and let those three feet grow. I think the problem that people have with beautyberry is that they again, this is a spring prune, the beauty berry, is they cut everything back and they leave everything. You will not have enough space for everything that grows. So go ahead and start by the oldest canes, get rid of those all together, get rid of a third of the oldest, the big thick ones, the ones that are in the way, whatever your problem is. And then the rest of them cut back to about a, you know 12 to 18 inches and vary the height. So it's a little more natural in shape. Crepe myrtles often are dormant pruned in the spring so that you can see the shape when you're pruning them. It's okay to summer prune them lightly because they grow so vigorously, you'll lose a few flowers. I think the biggest problem that I see with crepe myrtle pruning is do not do the crepe murder as they call it, which is basically chopping the top off of them, especially with crepe myrtle bark scale. You're going to encourage more of those pests because you created a helmet of new growth that they just love to sit in and nothing can get to them. So be more judicious in your pruning with crepe myrtles in light of the crepe myrtle bark scale, but make sure that you're pruning to keep the top open so that some light is penetrating through the canopy. Because if you can see light, it means there's airflow. It means predator insects can get in there and eat the scale and aphids and other things that they get. But generally speaking, I think that's the biggest problem they have is they get a little bit crowded. Lightly thinning is the technique I would call that. Thinning crepe myrtles occasionally is good. And if you have a branch that's like going into the house, get rid of the whole stem. Crepe myrtles make multiple stems. So you can get rid of that one stem. Hopefully it's not 12 inches across at this point. Crepe myrtles, you don't have to get rid of crossing necessarily. They graft really beautifully and they make these sort of, um, you know, like latticed framework. So they're not one that's a crossing branch issue. Um, but I would do spring pruning to get a nice shaping and then you could tune it up in the summer if you find that areas are too thick. I don't know if you have flowering vines, but flowering vines are a really good candidate for summer pruning. What you're really wanting to focus on is maintaining a main scaffold or structure and then prune back to that main structure every time you prune. So pick how you want it to spread out in its initial stages. You might have to let it grow and then prune it back. If you let every new shoot or branch grow, it's going to get overgrown like this one. It looks beautiful right now, to be honest, but if you go underneath and look up, it's it's quite a disaster under there because there are so many dead branches and also living branches that are twined. So only allow new shoots or branches to develop if you need to replace a section. But you really have to decide, this is my structure and I'm going to stick to it and keep coming back to that same structure. This I know is either a Japanese or Chinese wisteria, but the point of it is to show you where the growth points are. So all of these little knobby points are points where it will grow. 
There are obviously actual live shoots. Those are also growing points that you can come back to. So if my main scaffold, if this is extended beyond, I can cut where this line is. I could maybe even move it a little further. I didn't want to encroach on that arrow, but you're moving back. And so you're coming back to this point. Now, let's say that this whole branch is part of my scaffold, my main structure that I want to keep but a deer chewed the end of it. I don't like the way it looks anymore. I can certainly prune it back to this point. And then this shoot coming up, if you see this green piece coming off here, this will continue laterally and that can become my new scaffold here. So this is just to show you what points you're looking at, where you can cut it so you can maintain it. This is an example of an American wisteria. So the before is here on these two left pictures. There's a whole lot of vines. I think this was grown for two years, I think, before I got to it. And there's still more pruning to be done, but this was a spring flowering. So although this is a spring prune, I want you to think about this as a summer prune and come back to your main branches. So I want your main branches to look like this when you're done. There's gonna be a little more green growth because it's summer, but figure out what you want it to look like and then prune it. This whole section still needs more pruning, but there is a branch coming here. You can't see it, but there are three different plants on this trellis. There's a climbing rose and a grape. So I've decided what section the wisteria is gonna occupy and I'm gonna ruthlessly keep it in that section. So that's what you're gonna have to do when you have a vine. You have to decide and then just be ruthless. So here's an example of a coral honeysuckle on the left. We all have one of these if you have this plant. There's a section that just grows like that. It's pretty difficult to get any lower growth because they just keep going up to the sun. So if you have a lot of those naked lower stems and you want to encourage new shoots, you can take a cut lower like this, and then you're going to get two new shoots. If you start training those new shoots sideways, then you'll get them to keep more leaves and flower more vigorously. So this is an example of one that has a trellis. It's a little hard to see, and this could actually even use more pruning, but this is sort of in the training process. But you can see that there are wires, and the goal is to keep these going across. As soon as you turn horizontally, you're going to get more flowers. I've left some of these below here to cover the naked stems, as I'm calling them, but you can also trim some of those back. The trouble in a case like this is if I trim this whole thing back, I'm going to lose something up here, so I'll have to decide. But you really just have to be ruthless, and I know it's difficult, but these are usually very forgiving plants. Both species I've described are very forgiving. This is another example of a very forgiving species, crossvine. So unmanaged, you can see it here on the left. The flowers are beautiful, but it gets very unruly. In that case, it's probably in the rafters by now. On the right, you can see what it does. This is a tendril plant, and it will wrap around anything, including itself. So you end up with stems that are very entwined with other stems. So again, pick the main ones you want. This has just finished blooming in our area. Uh, it, if it's not too hot today, I'll go prune one of these either today or next week. And I'm going to follow the same uh, technique and come back all the way to my scaffolds, which means, you know, I might be cutting back to these little nubs, but each of these nubs has the opportunity to produce new shoots and new flowers. So I'm not worried that I'm going to kill the plant. If you're not sure, practice on it. Cut it a few times and see what happens and gain some confidence. Also, if it's a very young plant, maybe you want to give it more time to get a root set, but you can still prune it during that time, just maybe not as vigorously. So we talked about pruning woody perennials. You can, in theory, prune. It's not, I don't think it's officially pruning, but it's the same effect um, on herbaceous perennials. The common name people use for it is the Chelsea chop. I believe they call it this because it's around the time of the Chelsea flower show. July 1st is the deadline because of the way plants grow. So if you're cutting a bunch of stuff much later than July, that fall bloom might push into cold season and you might not get it as long of a bloom period. So what this involves is cutting a plant back by about a third or a half and you can do it multiple times in the season if you start early. I wouldn't start now and then do it three more times. For the multiple times, you probably started, you know, in May, potentially for some plants. What's the purpose of it? Well, in certain gardens, it's, it's really for aesthetics. You can highlight different plants during different seasons and change the height, delay bloom time. If you have plants that are always falling over, like into a walkway, you can prune those back and make it a little bit bushier or make the stem a little sturdier. I don't use this technique too much for late season foliage, but things like daylilies, if they get really ratty, you can cut back the foliage and start them anew. So there are different ways to use it. And I'll show you some examples of that in the garden. The technique is basically to go through like this person is doing with a pair of clippers, just because it's the way I prune, I tend to do individual stems. This should be a technique you can use some shears on. 
um, and do something larger scale if you have a large enough patch. If it's smaller, I would probably use hand shears so you're not accidentally cutting the stuff to the right or to the left, but you can experiment with that and see what works for you. Some of the downsides, I'll show you a couple of examples where something like seed heads might be removed. So if you are trying to get something to reseed in the garden, either don't do it for a few years to get things to reseed and get established, or don't chop everything. Selectively go through and individually take plants. You're still going to get less reseeding, so that's something to consider. I mean, it's work. It's it's work. Uh, so if you think that you know it's really a bad height in the garden that Monarda or whatever other plant, if it's the wrong height, if you can find another plant of a similar quality or texture for your garden, but it's a better height, you could also consider changing plants. Also, cutting plants really hard is an energy expenditure cost for plants. So it's worth considering adapting your strategy if you find that you Chelsea chop or prune an herbaceous perennial and it doesn't respond the way you think. Adapt your strategy. And I'll show you an example of that coming up here. So here are a few plants that I've used it on. Again, the list is extensive. These are by no means all the plants you can use it on. On the left, this is a patch of Monarda in this larger garden bed. This was sometime in, I guess we're in June now. So probably this was early May. It was already quite tall because we didn't really have much of a cold winter. So it took off. I decided to cut it back about, I think, a third to a half. Um, and what's the purpose of that? One is that you could actually see some of the other plants in the background much better. The whole composition of the garden is a little nicer. You can see the penstemons, the, the rose behind doesn't show all that well, but it does in person. The baptisia gets to take center stage, which it has a short season anyway, so I'd like it to look good. And it slows down the bloom on this Minarda, so I should get this bloom at a later time, and that's also helpful. So it'll be sort of an extension of the overall bloom in the garden. This is another example of um, bee balm. I'm including this one. This is another pre-bloom chop. I did this patch last year. I did this front part as a post-bloom chop. And after it bloomed, I thought, well, let me try it. I'll cut it back and see if it will re-bloom. It did not. And it never really looked good. I think because the heat took a toll on it, I took out a lot of leaves when it, there wasn't a whole lot of moisture. So I've adapted my strategy and I've done this in a, two ways. One is this first lower patch. I chopped back much earlier in the season. I think that was probably early May. And this second patch I cut maybe three weeks later. My goal is to have two different bloom times with this one patch. I also cut this front patch lower because it's much closer to the sidewalk, which is an issue. And sometimes the stems fall over. You know, these are pollinator magnets and people love pollinators, but they don't like to walk into pollinators. So I'd like to keep that up off the sidewalk if possible. So that's an example of strategy adapting, but you can also see how beautiful the Baptisia is in the background because you've given it an opportunity to be higher than the other items. This is Baptisia, false indigo. This is a post-bloom chop, I'll call it. You can see the seed pods on this one on the left. I love Baptisia seed pods. They're beautiful in this bed. The Baptisia reseeds like crazy. The problem with this one is that it's right next to the sidewalk again, and it falls into people or people have to step on it. So this year I decided to do a post bloom and I've cut it back about a third, mostly to get the heavy tips off. And then ideally it'll bush out and I'll still get that lovely round bushy texture, but I just won't have the flopping is the goal. So this is, it's really even hard to see because other plants are taller than it now. So we'll see how that works, but that's another plant that I know in several gardens I work in that flops a lot. So I might try this strategy in a few places to see if I can alleviate that a little bit. Amsonia hubrichtii, threadleaf blue star is another beautiful one. I love the texture. It's another one in this space that I probably planted in the wrong place. They're really difficult to move. So I'm gonna try this first uh, and I'm gonna cut it to half and I will see how that fills in. I didn't get a picture this morning, but these Onothera, the sun drops are even more numerous around here. So you can really see them now, which is nice. Um, and this should be filled in a little bit more. You'll still get the thread leaf texture. It'll still be lovely. My goal is this whole mass that you see on the left, I would like it to be slightly lower in the garden. This plant does reseed in my garden and I have enough that I, I don't need anymore. But if you're wanting it to spread, you would want to wait on this plant as well. I might also chop some of the things behind because they flop. That's obedient plant in the background. So this gives me an opportunity to chop both things and they'll hopefully still stay in place. In our area, this is another common native that needs chopping. Um, this is a New England aster. This is beautiful in a meadow. This is beautiful in a large rain garden where it has all the space with other grasses to 
expand and do what it likes to do. This is not a great place for it right at the base of a set of stairs. It feels very imposing. So I have decided to cut this back about half and pre-bloom, you can see it here on the left. This was, you know, early May and it was already this tall. So I know that this is going to get to between five and six feet. So I cut it about half the size of what it was at that point. And so the goal will be that it'll be bushier. An added side effect at this time of year was that you got to see the columbine and the, the blue hostas in the background, and it gave other parts of the garden a chance to sort of shine for their season. So we'll see if that's enough. I may also have to cut it again. I could let this grow up to about the height it is now and then not cut it quite as low, but cut it maybe a third. Um, so that is a technique you can use. You'll have to experiment and see if your plant can tolerate that. I think that this plant can because I know how vigorous it is. This is uh, also using this same strategy with annuals and sort of more ephemeral plants. So this larkspur is the wispy plant on the left. A few of them got pulled, but you can also just chop them lower. What you will not get from an annual or something ephemeral is that I don't expect these ones that I chopped to bloom. So here on the right is where I've chopped them. Um, what was the reason? I, I wanted to highlight all these alliums and the flax and the other things that were blooming at that time. I don't care if these larkspur right here at the edge bloom. And in fact, I don't really want them to bloom because again, they lean into the sidewalk. People that walk by think the flowers are pretty, but they think they're going to get stung by bees. So they don't enjoy that as much. So I don't mind that they're not at the, at the right at the sidewalk. I did, however, leave all the ones in the background and I didn't touch those. And three weeks later, those are blooming and the stuff in the front has now died back. So that's just sort of like a seasonal movement through the garden. And you can use a technique like that to um, play with some of those things. It's not really always about, I have to move plants. Maybe I can trim things and, and highlight different parts of the garden. You can Chelsea chop, like I said, uh, any number of things. I am not the Chelsea chop authority, unfortunately, but there are a lot of good literature out there on it. Um, so you can Google it. There are a couple really good books out there. Tracy D. Sabato has several books on it. So it's, it's well documented. No matter what you read in the books, you're going to have to try it in your garden and see. A couple general rules would be if you have something that has a single specimen type bloom, peonies, for example, larkspur, like I just showed you, those are probably not going to respond as well. You might get smaller blooms depending on the type of plant. I think I've read liatris, for example, even though that's a single stalk, you might be able to get two smaller stalks. You'll have to see what works in your garden because different growing environments will also affect whether a plant can do it. Timing the chop, you know, don't worry too much about that June, July date. What you're going for is if you know the plant is going to get to six feet, don't chop when it gets to four feet. Try to get it when it's lower so that it's earlier in the season and it's not in really hot weather because that makes the plant suffer more and it just might not recover as well. At this time of year, depending on where you are, you're probably targeting things that bloom in the fall. So if you want to try the chop out on a Joe Pie, any number of asters, golden rods, any of those would be good candidates. Ironweed, those would be all good ones you could try if those are too tall and in place and you want to manage it. Stuff that's going to bloom in the next two to three weeks, it may still work, but you're going to push the bloom time back. So think about that and if, if that's something that works in your garden. Like I said, it's well documented. So go check out some of those books and see if there's something that applies for your garden. And if you're not sure it's not listed, you can always try a chunk of it and, and see what happens. Not too bad. So I think we hit time. I'm going to have to research avocado a little more, but I think I covered the other plants. But if something else has come up, I am open for questions. We have a few more plant questions that came up during the Chelsea Chop conversation. Chrysanthemums? Chrysanthemums respond really well. Yep. Clematis? Clematis is a weird category. Clematis, depending on which it is, you're going to have to research which group your clematis falls into. And I am not a clematis authority, but I do know that they fall into different categories. And the way you prune them depends on which category it falls into, whether it's a new wood bloomer, an old wood bloomer, a double wood bloomer. So spend a little bit of time looking up what kind yours is first. I generally see them as being more like deadheading or cutting back the vine. If that's the case, I don't know that you would use like a chop strategy. If that makes sense, it's more of a vine pruning strategy for that, but you have to know when it blooms to know when to cut it. And then our last plant, sort of perennial favorite around here for folks is coneflower. I read a couple different things about coneflower. The echinacea, the straight purple coneflower, that's kind of like a, a one, 
I don't want to say a one hit wonder, but it, you know, it has often that really strong single bloom and then you can deadhead and get some smaller blooms. They tend not to be as nice. They do have it listed as one that you can chop and get some smaller blooms. You'll have to experiment with that in your garden and see if it works. I like that really strong upright presence of that one cone. <laughs> Uh, or multiple single cones. I don't think I'd want to lose that texture in some of the gardens that I work in, but you'll have to see how it works for you. The other one to try is for rutabecchias, which aren't technically cone flowers. Those are a little more bushier in habit, and those you can do a more post-bloom chop or a pre-bloom chop if they get too leggy and like fall over. Those aren't cone flowers, but they're similar family, and those you could do that with to get a bushier or a prolonged bloom. But those are really the more multiple blooms on that sort of more uh, spreading plant as opposed to the coneflower, which is that single stalk. One more plant under the wire, uh, just common milkweed. Common milkweed is one that I have used this on. We're getting kind of late, I would say. We're probably right at the border. If you cut a plant that's kind of really older looking, it may or may not look really great ever this season. Younger, kind of juicier looking plants that maybe are a little healthier will respond better. But this is a good strategy for getting them to stop flopping over. I have used it. Milkweed generally though, I don't think it's a good strategy for like controlling ratty looking foliage. I think eventually they just get ratty looking no matter what, but give it a try. It should work for those. The earlier you do it, the better you'll get an overall better shape. And then think about what the final height you want it to be. So, you know, you can cut it half or a third, depending on what you want the final height in the garden to be. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Mariah. Thank you everyone mm -hmm. for joining us today. I think we've all learned a lot. This was a fantastic session. Um, as a reminder to everyone, this class will be available online in about two weeks, and you can visit mgnv.org for our upcoming class schedule. So thank you, everyone. Happy gardening this weekend. Um, and everyone take care. Have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you.